Hello, this is Michael Paul with New Orleans Scottish Rite College. I'd like to do a video today that follows up on my last video on the 24-inch gauge. This one takes a look at another of the symbolic working tools of Freemasonry. In this video, we'll look at the common gavel. Now, the first thing that I want to do is clarify which gavel we're talking about. The common gavel that we will be discussing in this video is not the gavel that is used by the Worshipful Master or the two wardens. Those gavels are used during business meetings and degrees as instruction or information for individual Masons or the entire Lodge. The common gavel that we will be discussing is a symbolic gavel that is used in speculative Freemasonry by each individual Mason and for very specific reasons. Here is an excerpt from the Louisiana Masonic Monitor. If you're from another jurisdiction, this short section might vary slightly, but the meaning will be the same. The common gavel is an implement used by operative masons to break off the corners of rough stones, the better to fit them for the builder's use. But we, as free and accepted masons, are taught to use it for the more noble and glorious purpose of divesting our hearts and consciousness of all the vices and superficialities of life, thereby fitting our minds as living stones for that spiritual building, that house, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. As with so many of the symbols in Freemasonry, we have taken something that is common with a specific meaning and applied new meanings to it that may not be obvious to the casual observer. We might think of the common gavel as more of an action than an actual working tool. The common gavel can be seen as the act of self-improvement. The stone that is being worked on is known as the rough asher. For an operative mason, the rough asher would be a stone coming directly from the quarry. At the quarry, they would normally just cut out pieces of rough stone quickly and send it on to the worksite. At the worksite, stone masons would smooth out the stones by use of their gavels. The stones would then be in a condition useful to be placed directly in whatever they were building. In speculative Freemasonry, we interpret the rough asher to be the individual human being. He is of sound material, but needs work. He's rough around the edges, untrained and untaught. He is said to be in darkness. The common gavel is the act of smoothing out those rough edges or teaching him, bringing him to light. The common gavel smooths out a rough asher for the operative mason and turns it into what is known as the perfect asher. The goal of these lessons in speculative masonry is to take the sound but rough and untrained human being knock off all the rough edges, and hopefully make him of a quality that he can move on when his days are done to a more rewarding spiritual life. If we think of an operative lodge, we can imagine rows and rows of operative Freemasons working on rough pieces of stone. They are all doing the same thing. They're trying to make their stones better than they were when they received them. They are doing the best possible work based on their skill. In speculative Freemasonry, we might think of that operative lodge as the entire earth. The rough stone or asher is our lives. Every single human being is trying to do the same thing, make their life better. But not everyone will end up improving their lives. Not everyone has the right tools or instruction. Not everyone has an interest in doing the work needed to improve themselves. But for those who are willing to do the work, the common gavel can be seen as that act of self-improvement. We apply certain teachings and skills in order to knock off the rough edges of our life. For those who understand the true meaning of the common gavel, they will know that this is a lifelong task. It's a task that only ends with the ending of our physical lives. The state of a rough asher at the close of anyone's physical life will depend on the work they have done during their life. There are also some rules as to how we use our common gavels. We might think of a large classroom or even an old operative lodge with many people working near each other on their own personal rough stones. We can see the people around us doing their work and we can see their progress. It's not at all considered cheating if we see someone doing exceptional work and try to emulate them to copy their technique in our own work. It's also not considered cheating if someone sees what we are doing and tries to copy our work. This is considered working together and simply trying to lift each other up by example. 
What is considered cheating is to directly involve yourself in another's work. It's not allowed for you to chip away at another's stone any more than someone should be allowed to chip away at yours. We all do our own work, and while we may well influence each other, we must understand that the act of influencing someone is a personal choice. There is a big difference between seeing another's work, recognizing the skill that's present in their work, and deciding for yourself that you want to do work at that level of skill, as opposed to actually doing the work for someone else. There is no personal advancement in having your work accomplished by someone else. There is another aspect of self-improvement that I must cover, and it's not a very pleasant one. It has to do with envy. It's when we look at the work of another, recognize the skill and the quality of the work, but instead of trying to emulate that work in our own work, we become envious. We do nothing but stare in anger at the wonderful work of another. We allow the negative aspects of human nature to take control of us. We feel envy, jealousy, and then bitterness and resentment. Why can't I be doing work like this of a person? Or why should they be able to do what I can't do? If our ego takes control, then total destruction can follow. There will be no self-improvement at all. Negative feelings not only prevent us from personal advancement, but they can place unproductive roadblocks for others. From an organizational standpoint, if our leaders are controlled by ego, lust for power, or glory, then the only ones that they will select as their lieutenants, the ones who will follow them, are ones who will be of clear lesser skill than these unworthy leaders. Ego and envy will cause such leaders to hold back, deny advancement, or destroy the reputation of anyone they believe could possibly outshine them. The quality of leadership will then diminish with each leadership change that follows until the organization is of no value whatsoever. The leaders must be of the highest moral quality as well as skill. They must recognize that we all shine with our own level and variety of light. A leader must not be envious of the skill of another, but rejoice when he finds a skill in another worker. Great skill in a subordinate means the future success of the whole organization. Long-term success of any organization should always be the goal of the true leader. Make no mistake, ego must never be allowed to take control. Ego can destroy all that we hold dear. In any work towards self-improvement, we must recognize that generosity of spirit, kindness, and peace of mind are key to any successful life. But we must also recognize the need for unyielding determination to not allow the unworthy to gain access or remain in any sort of leadership position. A useful life must be a benefit to ourselves and others. We must showcase the good work of others. We must recognize and hold up the good work of others, as well as finding ways to incorporate that work into our own work. When someone asks us for help in their work, we must be generous but not do the work for them or demand that they make changes that they don't desire. We must recognize that we all have our own path and no one has the right to force an unwanted path on anyone else. And when our days are done, we must be ready to display our work for examination. Of course, the catch is that since we never know when that day will come, wasting time or putting off our work of personal advancements until later on. Could be a serious mistake. No one wants to leave behind an unfinished trestle board. Thank you for watching. If you find the video of value, please hit the like button and subscribe to us. See you next time.